Hey everyone, it's Pastor Steve and Pastor Aaron of That Church and we are grateful that you are spending time with us today. And here we're talking about chapter 7 today of 1 Corinthians, right? Right. So let's start off with a word of prayer and we will get right into it. Awesome. So Father God, you are our teacher by your spirit that's right here in us speaking given us your thoughts, your ways of doing and being right, and we hold to what you show us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, oh, we talked yesterday about, really, conflict resolution, mm -hmm. and it was good. You see in how to realistically think about how God has led us to really do things before the brethren, but not so much do things before the world. Right. Holding what what you do up before the Father and, and men of God. Men that that know how to deal with conflict resolution, right? Right. So in this, we're getting into chapter seven and it's gonna be talking about really marriage and celibacy. Right? So in this, I wanna go back and read. Uh, probably starting at verse 19 of chapter 6 and we'll read into 7 and it'll 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 show the transition okay right. All right how it flows one into another right verse 19 of 6 do you not know that your body is the temple the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives within you whom you have received as a gift from God you are not your own you were bought with a price purchased with a preciousness and paid for, made his own. So then honor God and bring glory to him in your body. Now as to the matters of which you wrote me, it is well and by that I mean by that I mean advantageous, expedient, profitable and wholesome for a man not to touch a woman, to cohabit with her, but to remain unmarried. Aha. Uh -huh. So <laughs> So in this you see that he's He's really talking about how we were purchased as with blood, right? The mm -hmm. blood of Jesus purchased our freedom from Satan. Gave us a point, brought us into a point to where we could make a decision. Whether we're going to serve God, be his, or be the enemies, right? Right. So in that, you have choices always. You have a decision to make. And why would you make decisions? If you've decided to be Christ, why would you make decisions? You make decisions based on what? The Holy Spirit in you, given those thoughts. And, and here, showing you that's what he's talking about. A vouching. What, what thoughts you're about to act on, right? Mm -hmm. Because you want to act on what he's showing you. If, if you act on the thoughts of the enemy, you're going to get led away in your thoughts and in your actions then because you think about things before you go and do them. Most of the time, <laughs> most of us, you know, think about it before we start opening up this little thing on, on the face of our bodies here. But <laughs> as we choose words of life, we can have abundant life. And he's leading us to that abundant life. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this. Why are we making decisions? Why, what decisions are we making that we can make right decisions that benefits the people that are around us, that benefits us? Are, are we to make decisions that benefit us? Yeah. But do we do that in, in all actuality to hurt somebody else? No, we're not supposed to. We're supposed to walk along with God and our brethren, right? Remember right. how we kept yep. on talking about yep. that yep. yesterday. <laughs> all right, we're walking along together as a body of Christ, making decisions, taking words and speaking things that work for our good as well as for the good of all those that are around us. So let's 
Let's jump into this a little farther. So we finally got to verse two. <laughs> <laughs> but because of the temptation to impurity and to avoid immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. See, there's a decision there. Okay. You know, he's saying here, it's best to stay celibate because then you're not tied betwixt. You're having to make a decision regarding somebody else or having to consider them and Jesus. Wouldn't it be just better to consider Jesus and follow what he tells you to do and, and to be doing things that are right before him, right? Okay. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, goodwill, kindness, and what is due her as his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have exclusive authority and control over her own body, but the husband has his rights. Likewise also the husband does not have exclusive authority and control over his body, but the wife has her rights. Do not refuse and deprive and defraud each other of your due marital, right, marital rights, except perhaps by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourselves unhindered to prayer. But afterwards, resume marital relations, lest Satan tempt you to sin through your lack of restraint of sexual desire. Okay, so in that, we're, we're just watching that we're not causing our partner to sin because here you're you're keeping something from them if you're keeping something from them is that not allowing the, <laughs> the enemy then to to come in and and use that desire that's mm -hmm. that's in them against them yeah. and against the marriage against you in all actuality so in that you keep peace in the home because here, you've got somebody else to consider. And here, mm. you're to become one flesh. Well, that flesh idea, is it spirit? Oh, so we're talking the difference between spirit, soul, and body. The body is something the Lord purchased as well, right? Our spirit man is, is supposed to be in ascendancy. But here, we're living in this body. We're dealing with thoughts through our mind, our will, and our emotions, right? And through all of that, we're walking along with the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and considering other people, considering others in the body of Christ. Right. And here, then he gets into talking about how is it then if that, that other person, you're, you, know, you came into the body of Christ, married, but that other person doesn't want to join in, uh, doesn't believe, mm -hmm. right? right? If that other person doesn't believe, well, there's there's things you've got to consider in all that as well. So let's read through a lot of that, and then I'll talk a little bit more. But I am saying this more as a matter of permission and concession, not as a command or regulation. I wish that all men were like myself, like I myself am in this matter of self-control. But each has his own special gift from God, one of this kind and one of another. But to the unmarried people and to the widows, I declare that it is well, good, advantageous, expedient and wholesome for them to remain single even as I do. But if they have not self-control, restraint of their passions, they should marry. For it is better to marry than be aflame with passion and tortured continually with ungratified desire. And that's, that's somewhere that we don't want to be. Because here, the enemy is going to use whatever he can against you and stir it up and, and keep you know, even parading people in front of you. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so think about that as we're going through this. You're walking along with the Spirit. And how do you get out of those things? If, if the enemy's per, per, parading as that, that thought is, you have to take his thoughts. You don't fight thoughts with thoughts. You fight thoughts with the Word of God. You make decisions and say, based on this scripture, I'm walking this out in my life, and I cast down those vain imaginations, those thoughts and high things that are trying to exalt themselves 
above what? The, the word, word of God, God that you're standing on. Yeah. That's what it's about. What are you standing on? Excuse me. What are you standing on? And who are you working with? You're working with people, but the Holy Spirit is who you're working with. And you're not so much working, but you're walking along this life. And he's leading and guiding about what you see in the word, right? Because he's constantly bringing that up to you, mm -hmm. what you've seen in the word, right? Yeah. Okay. Verse 10, but to the married people, I give charge, not I, but the Lord, that the wife is not to separate from her husband. But if she does separate from and divorce him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to her husband. And I charge the husband also that he should not put away or divorce his wife. To the rest I declare, I, not the Lord, for Jesus did not discuss this, that if any brother has a wife who does not believe in Christ, and she contents, consents to live with him, he should not leave or divorce her. If any man, if any woman has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she should not leave or divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is set apart, separated, withdrawn from heathen contamination, and affiliated with the Christian people by union with his consecrated set-apart wife. And the unbelieving wife is set apart and separated through union with her consecrated husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, unblessed heathen, outside the Christian covenant. But as it is, they are prepared for God, pure and clean. Okay, so what I want you to see here is he said in, in verse... Where did I... Where did I see that? Oh, I went too far. That's why I don't see it. <laughs> uh, verse 12, you see see that he, he clarifies. This is my opinion. And here, he's a spiritual man. Mm -hmm. And he's giving you a spiritual opinion. But he's not saying, this is, from the, this is not from the Lord, he's saying. But, but realize, you have decisions to make. And you have godly wisdom from godly people around you right. to, to take in consideration. But he's, he's making it clear, this is not from the Lord, but then he'll, he'll go into, this is from the Lord. And, and I want you to differentiate what is from the Lord and what is not from the Lord. And it's, it's your decision before the Lord, right? That's what he's, he's getting into here. But I, I want you to, to differentiate between what his, his opinion and what is from the Lord. Right? Okay, listen. But if the unbelieving partner actually leaves, let him do so. In such cases, the remaining brother or sister is not morally bound. But God has called us to peace. For, wife, how can you be sure of converting and saving your husband? Husband, how can you be sure of converting and saving your wife? Only let each one seek to conduct himself and regulate his affairs so as to lead the life which the Lord has allotted and imparted to him and to which God has invited and summoned him. This is my order in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his summons from God already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the evidence of circumcision. Was anyone at the time God called him uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. For circumcision is nothing and counts for nothing, neither does uncircumcision. But what counts is keeping the commandments of God, which are to love yourself and love your neighbor. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? You want me to keep going? Um, let's see. That was verse 19. Yeah, only one thing matters, yeah. and it is keeping the commandments of the Lord, which is what? To walk in love, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. To 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 walk in love toward your neighbor, as you walk in love toward God. You walk in love toward God as you walk in love toward your neighbor, and here you're supposed to love yourself all at the same time. Yep, you because know, God made you, right. and you are a masterpiece. Yes. You are. Everyone should remain after God calls him in the station or condition of life in which the summons found him. Were you a slave when you were called? Do not let that trouble you. But if you are able to gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. 
For he who as a slave was summoned in to union with the Lord is a freed man of the Lord, just as he who was free when he was called is a bond servant of Christ the Messiah. Do you understand how he started off there? He said, all of you, whatever way you came into the Lord, you, 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 wherever you are at in life, in, in your station, as, as he called it, if, if you were poor, you should stay poor. No, that mm -hmm. isn't right. If you were a slave, you should stay a slave. No, that, that isn't right. What he does go on there and say, okay, if, if you can get out of being a slave, yeah, get out. It's, it's advantageous to you. If you were poor, get out of being poor. Jesus came. He was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. And what's that gospel to the poor? That you don't, you don't have, have to, to be, be poor, poor no, no more. more. Right? <laughs> so if, if you're looking at things in the word as he's saying it, he's giving opinions as well as he's giving here. The Lord said, wherever you're at, he accepts you that way. But he did not intend to leave you that way. Right. If you if you believe you can get out of it, get out of it. It's it's your belief in the one that chose you, right? The one that that you chose, right? Because it was your decision to receive him as Lord and Savior, to receive what God did in Christ, right? From the foundation of the world. And here, from that point, you're moving on with him. And here, doesn't it say, if you know the, the Lord took on poverty, that you could be abundantly supplied? So if you were not abundantly supplied before, you can have abundantly supplied. He's not saying you should stay right where you're at and, and, and stay in that poverty, stay as a slave. No, he's saying move on with the Holy Spirit as you can see it in his word, right? Okay. Verse 23, you were bought with a price, purchased with a preciousness and paid for by Christ. And I was just noticing that's the same thing he ended chapter 6 with. Mm -hmm. You were bought with a price, purchased with a preciousness and paid for, made his own. That was worth repeating. Yeah. You are bought with a price and you are yeah. precious. That's right. Then do not yield yourselves up to become, in your own estimation, slaves to men, but consider yourselves slaves to Christ. So, brethren, in whatever station or state or condition of life each one was when he was called, there let him continue with and close to God. So, hold on. I want to address something else here, too, because of what he just said. He said, um, here, what verse is That was here? verse 24. Okay. So, brethren, in whatever station or state or... Uh, no, or condition I want to go right before that. Okay. The, the end of 23, it says... In your own estimation, slaves to men. Let's see here. I need to go back a little farther. Do no. not yield yourselves up to become, in your own estimation, slaves to men. But, but slaves to Christ. Yeah. And here, the, the translators took that word slaves and put it in there. But here, are you a servant of God? No, he doesn't call us servants. Are you a slave of God? No, he doesn't call us slaves. What did he want? He wanted sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. That's good. Is not in a household, the children as they're being taught how to do things, they seem like they're slaves almost because you're telling them to do this, <laughs> telling them to do that. Right? Right. But, but <laughs> they may be heir of the whole estate, as it says in another place. That's a great way to say it. And here, when that person is fully at aware of how to do things, how to come in, how to go out, how to do this, how to do that, and do it right, then they are the full master of that estate. Yeah, that's good. And here, as we grow up, that's where we're at with God. We're growing with Him. We're growing as He's teaching us, training us how to come in and go out. And when we're coming in and going out, that's why the Holy Spirit's there 24-7 with us to help us 
walk. That's why your focus should be on Him. Your focus should be on God and how to walk this life out and in the best of your ability, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And as you do that, He intends to bring you up and out of whatever junk you're in. He accepted you right where you're at, but He didn't intend to leave you in sin. No, He made that blood was to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, cause you to be a brand new creature, right? Go back to Galatians uh, 2.20, right? And in that, be looking and seeing that God is working with you to be his son and daughter, to, to speak as he speaks, to move and lay hands on as he does, Right? To look just like Jesus. Right? Right. Okay. Verse 25. Now concerning the virgins, the marriageable maidens, I have no command of the Lord. But I give my opinion and advice as one who, by the Lord's mercy, is rendered trustworthy and faithful. I think then, because of the impending distress that is even now setting in, it is well, expedient, profitable, and wholesome for a person to remain as he or she is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you do not sin in doing so. And if a virgin marries, she does not sin in doing so. Yet those who marry will have physical and earthly troubles, and I would like to spare you that. I mean... Brethren, the appointed time has been winding down, and it has grown very short. <laughs> From now on, let even those who have wives be as if they had none. Uh, <laughs> and those who weep and mourn as though they were not weeping and mourning. Okay, and <laughs> so because we're here, and we're uh, much farther than where the Apostle Paul was right. when he wrote this, mm -hmm. can you see that things have really come to an end, it seems. So is it to the end? It says in the word that Jesus said this, just just mm -hmm. like in the day of Lot, just like in the day of Noah, mm -hmm. people were gonna be being given in marriage and taken in marriage, right? And here, are you should should you look at it as you know, boy, it, we're right here at the end of time. I don't want to take a wife, I, you know. But here, you're going to then allow, if you're desiring a wife, you're going to allow the enemy to work in your life and hurt you with it. Constantly be dragging you across the coals, as per se, right? But here, is it not that you're doing things before the Lord? You make decisions with Him. If you're to marry... Marry. Mm -hmm. If you're not to marry, don't marry. But that's why I was pointing out these are things he's saying as his opinion. But here at the end, he's saying, boy, is it is it wise to put yourself in that split type of idea? You know, you're supposed to be one flesh. Well, are you... Are you acting that way? Are you acting as he he ended up there to, to get rid of that anxiety? Are you then just devoting yourself before the Lord to walk before him, to walk with him, right? I know I'm not answering a question for you, but I want <laughs> you to think clearly about what is being said. And here, take it from the Lord. Think upon these things and make decisions with the Lord, not on, on, on another person's opinion. Because these aren't meant to be legalistic rules that you have to follow. That's what I want you to get. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right, here we go. And those who weep and mourn as though they were not weeping and mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they did not possess anything. And those who deal with this world overusing the enjoyments of this life mm. as though they were not absorbed by it and as if they had no dealings with it. For the outward form of this world, the present world order, is passing away. My desire is to have you free from all anxiety and distressing care. 
that's our desire for you too. That's right. That was his desire for them. It's God's desire for all of us yeah. to be free from anxiety and care. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly matters, how he may please his wife. And I don't, I don't know if anxious is the right word in our terms. Anxious is a kind of a negative thing. And I don't know that it's so much anxious as it is uh, consumed with or, you know, it kind of takes his time. He's, he's having to hold in mind, just as anybody that's married, you hold in mind, you consider mm -hmm. your wife in all of your decisions. Yeah. Okay. Did Abraham consider his wife in all of his decisions? It seemed as though he did not. And I want you to look at that. You could go back and read some of that stuff. He, here, he he comes up first mm. to... to uh, I'm not sure where he was at, but he says to his wife, now you are my sister because we're same, from that same lineage, right? So just say you're my sister so they don't kill me. Was that considering his wife? No. So here, did everything that Abraham did, was it right? He was Probably doing, not. He <laughs> not was doing certain things toward the Lord in faith and here. Was that one of them? Was he, was he considering his relationship with in the Lord? And it's it's good to go back and consider those things. All of that in the Old Testament was given for our example. Example, so we mm -hmm. so we can look into somebody else's life that ready went through it, and we can see the outcome of what decisions they did make. And here, that's what I want you to see. I want you to see here, you're, if you're going to make decisions, these are some of the things that you're going to have to deal with. As a married man, married wife, or a single person, right? You make good decisions with the Lord as you walk with the Holy Spirit, right? Okay. Verse 34, and he is drawn in diverging directions. His interests are divided and he is distracted from his devotion to God. And the unmarried woman or girl is concerned and anxious about the matters of the Lord, how to be wholly separated and set apart in body and spirit. But the married woman has her cares centered in earthly affairs, how she may please her husband. Now I say this for your own welfare and profit, not to put a halter of restraint upon you, but to promote what is seemly and in good order and to secure your undistracted and undivided devotion to the Lord. Now, it's all supposed to be devoted before the Lord. Remember, he was saying, whatever you do in thought or in action, do it all unto the Lord. Well, some, some of that seems to be kind of difficult, but it is something as you walk with the Lord, you're always thinking about him, and you're always including him in your thoughts and your decisions. Look into him. Look into him and walking with him, as I've been saying, right? Okay. But if any man thinks that he is not acting properly toward and regard to his virgin, that he is preparing disgrace for her or incurring reproach, in case she is passing the bloom of her youth, and if there is need for it, let him do what to him seems right. He does not sin. Let them marry. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, strong in mind and purpose, not being forced by necessity, but having control over his own will and desire, and has resolved this in his heart to keep his own virginity, he is doing well. So also then, he, the father who gives his virgin, his daughter, in marriage, does well. And he, the father who does not give her in marriage, does better. A wife is bound to her husband by law as long as he lives. If the husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she will, only provided that he too is in the Lord. But in my opinion, a widow is happier, more blessed and to be envied if she does not remarry. And also I think I have the Spirit of God. So in that last statement, he said, in all of this, I believe I have a witness from the Holy Spirit. Right. Does that, that, that sound a little different? But it says, I think I have the Spirit of God. Okay. 
He has the Spirit of God. And here, always you're bouncing ideas off of him. Talking to him. Seeing which way you should go. And this is what he's saying. He's saying, I believe I have a witness about all of these things. I don't think I, I so much gave you anything outside of what he would agree with. Right. Okay? And here, you make decisions with the Holy Spirit. And you consider these thoughts if you're going through these things. And that's what it's all about. Remembering who he is to you and who you are to him. Right? Right. Okay. So in all of this, we want you to remember that it's my turn. That it's my wife's turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun doing it's so ministry Friday. together. It's so much Friday that, <laughs> you know, I love God and you love him too. And, and here we get to talk about coming up, having the ability to come up and out of where we're at. That's what God gives us. Every time there's an offering uh, available to us, mm -hmm. it's, it's a time of considering. It's a time of thinking, I could, I could come up. I could, I could increase my income. How? By sowing. If, if a farmer sows seed, does he not expect to harvest? Absolutely. Or why would he ever sow seed? Right? Right. Same same as in, you know, sowing unto the Lord and expecting a harvest. Right? Okay. Well, last week in our giving time, we talked about storehouses. And we defined them. I'll, I'll review that just a little bit. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a storehouse as a building for storing goods and uh, an abundant supply or source. And then the Noah Webster Dictionary says a storehouse is a building for keeping grains or goods of any kind and a repository, which is a place where things are or may be deposited for safety or preservation. And I got that word storehouse out of Malachi 3 verse 10. And we're going to read it again. Malachi 3 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall be not room enough to receive it. And so when we talked about the storehouse last week, we talked about bringing our first fruits, like it talks about in Deuteronomy, bringing our, our tithe and our offering into the storehouse. And in today, today's terms, the storehouse is the church. It's where you're fed. And so when you give in, it's a place of storing things, but it's also a place of giving out things. And when your pastor speaks to you the word of God, the living word of God, that's food. That's feeding you. We, even sometimes it talks about the food being milk when you're young and immature and the food being strong meat when you're more mature and able to handle it. And so the storehouse is a place where things come in and things go out. So the pastor teaches you God's word and that feeds your spirit. And the church also has a place in its community where they can do outreaches. They can help feed people. They can help minister to the needs of their community. So the church is a storehouse. And last time we talked about giving into the storehouse. Today, I just wanted to talk a little bit about receiving from the storehouse. So as your pastors, we want to sow into you and we want to feed you God's word. And we thank you that as God's direction, you give into the storehouse and you enable for us to be able to devote ourselves to feeding you and feeding the community, feeding the body of Christ. And um, what, I, what I really want to get to, the, the verse that I really want to get to is 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. And while she's going there, I want you to think of this as well. That you're not so much, whenever you bring something to God, the tithing is not the money. The tithing is the words that you're putting inside yeah. the money. As if the, the, the money is the husk around the seed. And when you sow, you're sowing into your heavenly account. Mm -hmm. Thing, things are sown unto God 
And here, he keeps track of all of that. Believe me, he's a good steward of your, your, your stuff coming into the kingdom, right? So all of that being said, I want you to realize that you have a heavenly account and you can withdraw from that heavenly account. And that's what she's talking about today is taking things out of that heavenly account. All right. Right. So this is what it says in 2 Corinthians. I guess I didn't get all the way there. I was so excited listening to what he had to say. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 9 and verse 8. You can read 6 through 8, but uh, just to summarize. Verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. And so I, what I want to present to you is not only is the church a storehouse, but you're a storehouse. And it excites me to know that when someone has a need, God's already abundantly supplied me more than I need so I can minister to the needs mm -hmm. of others. And that's not just us as pastors. That's everybody. This has always been something I've, I've strived to be able to do. When I see someone have a need, I want to look inside and say, God, are, are you... Do I get to give to this? Do I get to help them? And it's all for his glory. But how fun is it to live life, not just believing for us four and no more, but to believe for an abundance, to be that storehouse, mm -hmm. to let him fill you up. So our encouragement today is follow his lead. Give where he's telling you to give to. Fill his storehouse yeah. and be a storehouse. That's right. So anything else you want to say before we pray? I could say all kinds more things, but okay. I think we will just uh, end it with this. God loves God you. God loves you. And we, we love, love you. And, and Jesus, Jesus is, is Lord. Lord. Now take your place. As you take his anointing to, to your, your world. world. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.